Back in grammar school, they taught us all about crocodiles and what to do if you ever meet one. Don't try to run because you're on their territory and they can ensnare you in one of their long tentacles before you take your first stride. Plus, they can clear vast distances with their powerful hind legs, each one the size of an adult human, and their strong forelegs can climb any surface and dig through almost any barrier. You might be able to hide because we don't know how they sense their prey. They can't rely on vision or hearing in this pitch dark wind. They may use scent or maybe they detect motion somehow. Nobody's ever hidden from one, but you might be the first. The only real viable strategy though is to attack. Crocodiles do have a few weaknesses that a human can exploit. They have soft spots on their underbelly where the carapace doesn't extend all the way around. They ha um, I know where all of their major organs are because I watched Frank the Butcher carve one up for some fancy banquet after a few hunters had gotten lucky, returning from the night in one piece and with fresh game. But their main weakness, the easiest one to reach, is the exact center of the pincer that's right in front of me right now, sticking out of the creature's head. The impenetrable shell contains two knife-sharp claws, but at their midpoint is a forest of a hundred wriggling tongues, each one about the size of your little finger. If you manage to strike at the pincer's heart and hit those slimy appendages dead on, then you might kill it in one stroke. That pincer is so close, I can feel one of its edges scrape against my throat. It could slice my head off before I could even react. I try to summon all of my courage, brace my feet on the slippery ground to deliver one great blow to the warm spot at the pincer's fulcrum. I can do this. I'm strong enough. I raise both fists. Then, I stop because I can feel warm breath coming from below this pincer where the creature's mouth is and that part of me that's always standing back and pulling everything apart instead of just blurting out words all the time is asking, why is a crocodile's mouth so far away from all of these tongues anyway? She can't possibly be using them to taste anything or, or to make any sounds. Why are they right at the center of this armored scissor, vulnerable yet shielded? I lower my fists. Instead, I push my unprotected face forward, almost losing my balance in the dark. The pincer is all around my head and neck now, but it doesn't close and kill me. Instead, this crocodile lets me press my forward and push my frostburnt nose into the moist heat of her slimy, warm grubs. They brush my face and my head floods with urgent smells and disorienting sounds of beautiful ugliness, too much to handle, and like I'm out of my head drunk with no up, no down, nothing but a whirl of sensory overload. I almost keel over, but somehow I stay upright until I'm somewhere else. I'm way out in the middle of the night now, surrounded by huge sheets of ice on all sides. A mountain of ice and snow sidles past along the horizon. We are thousands of kilometers out than any human has gone in 25 generations since we lost all of our scout ships and our all-terrain vehicles. Somehow, I can see in the night now, except I realize I'm not seeing at all. I'm using alien senses and my mind is turning them into sight and sound. I tear through the landscape so fast, the wind can't keep up. A sudden storm could rip me apart, the tundra could swallow me whole, but I don't even care. My back legs push against the ground and the ice surrenders, while my smaller front legs dig into the slick surface, propelling me even faster and keeping my balance. I'm not running. This is something much, much better. I've never felt so much power in my body and so many sensations flooding into my flood into the ends of my two great tentacles as they taste the wind around me. I want to laugh. And then I turn and see that four other crocodiles are running alongside me, grasping some spiky devices in their tentacles and guiding a sled full of some precious metal. 
I feel a surge of pride, safety, happiness, that they're with me and we're going home. Then we reach it, a huge structure in the shape of a rose with all of its petals spread, a circle <coughs> surrounded by elaborate crisscrossing arch shapes. Only the very top pokes above the surface and the rest extends far below the ice, but still its beauty almost stops my heart. A glimmering city in the middle of the night, many times larger than Tiosvant, that no human eyes have ever seen. So now I'm going to skip to the very end of the novel, but it's not a spoiler, I promise. And uh, we're going to kind of revisit that same scene that I just read from the point of view of the creature that uh, Sophie, the main character, was interacting with. Um, Rose keeps reminding me of when we first met. She shows me how I looked back then, out on the ice, wearing my secondhand trendy clothes, dying, terrified. She showed me that memory before, but this time I can more easily identify with her perspective. I'm Rose, and I see this human shivering from cold and terrified rage, and she does that animal thing of tensing to fight or, or run. But then, instead, she does something that no human has ever willingly done before. Tilt her head back, let my tendrils touch her bare flesh, I feel Rose's surprise, her euphoria, her sense that something perverted and maybe wonderful is happening here. Um, I try to ask Rose the question that's been bothering me ever since I came to the city in the middle of the night. What, what do the, the Gellet, the, these creatures, believe in? I have to ask several times, and then she seems to get it because she unfolds an ancient memory the oldest one that anybody has ever shared with me. Or maybe not a memory, maybe a legend, or a little of both. I can tell its age by the smooth edges, the lack of sensory detail, and the easy flow of the events, the same way that humans can spot when a story has been told and retold by a long chain of people, because it makes too much sense. Long ago, before the first civilization rose up on this planet, everyone lived in scattered burrows all over the night with no more than 100 people per burrow. They wove their tendrils together whenever anybody wanted to share information about what she had seen or what she had done. Or somebody might come up with a simple idea that she shared with everyone else, like a way to harvest more roots and grubs to feed into the web where their children were developing, or how to strengthen their barriers against ice slides and avalanches. And that's when their greatest love story took place. These two people who had grown up in different burrows came together after some brutal ice storms drove them away from their homes. The two refugees became inseparable and their tendrils were intertwined whenever they weren't working or eating. They slept with their pincers wrapped around each other in their own mossy nook where the cool air ran over their carapaces. Their dreams flowed back and forth between them and their memories of fleeing their homes blended together until they almost shared the same past. Everyone else recoiled because this couldn't possibly be healthy for them. Plus, they were excluding the rest of the community, which was hurtful. Um, people tried to pry the two of them apart physically or sent one or the other of them off on long errands outside the burrow. At last, one of the oldest and most patient of the burrow's residents decided to talk to both of them together and find out exactly what perversion they had been drawn into. And then there were three of them. Entangled, inextricable, people began talking about evicting all three of them. What had seduced these three into such an unnatural closeness? A set of designs for a water wheel. Using the nearby underground river to operate a crude mill that would help them separate out the poisonous part of some mushrooms that grew in the nearby caves. This was such a complex idea that one person couldn't possibly invent it alone and then share it with everyone else. The concept needed to be shaped among two or more people working together. 
They couldn't even share it with the others until they had the concept. And these lovers had discovered a powerful thrill, a joy that went all the way down to their stomachs in weaving a big idea together, like, like some wild rapture, the sensation of helping others to imagine something bigger than yourselves. Somehow, this weird love story is the foundation of this community's politics, or, or maybe religion. Rose lingers on the oddest parts, where, like when they finally reveal their invention to the rest of the community, or the tenderness when this couple becomes a trio. I sense the echoes from all of the countless other times that people have passed this legend around, and the lesson that comes with it. To join with others to shape a future is the holiest act. This is hard work, and it never stops being hard, but this collective dreaming slash designing is the only way that we get to keep surviving, and this practice defines us as a community. Even the other communities that live apart from the Midnight City, scattered all over the night in smaller cities or towns, they all share this same origin story. Thank you. And And in case I forget, can we get a round of applause for Michelle, our sign language interpreter, who is amazing, and I'm so glad that she could be here today. Thank you so much.